This week's toe portion um, is called Kitavo. Um, as we know, Moses is speaking to the Jewish people. The Jewish people are on the cusp of moving into the land of Israel. They're leaving behind their desert existence. They're going into the land. And Moses is speaking to them, telling them what they need to know to be able to function, to be able to exist without the overt miracles of the manna and the water coming from the rock and the clouds of glory and all of the ways in which God is sustaining and taking care of the Jewish people as they've been traveling through the desert. They're about to go into the land. Moses is not going to go with them. We know that. And what we're learning now is Moses's last speech to the Jewish people. This is what you need to know. This is what I want to tell you. Before I, Moses, am going to die, I'm not going to go into the land with you. The other leaders, Joshua, is going to take the people in. Uh, but he's, he's, he's speaking out to them what they need to know. And uh, one of the things that they learn in this week's Torah portion, which is unbelievable, and it's always positioned right here before, before Rosh Hashanah, so it's perfect. Um, we're going to tie in some of the ideas of this week's Torah portion and Rosh Hashanah. So I'm going to just read the beginning of this week's Torah portion and we'll use that as a launching pad. So it will be, when you enter the land, ki tava, when you enter the land that Hashem your God gives you as an inheritance and you possess it and you dwell in it, that you shall take of the first of your fruit of the ground that, that you bring in from your land that Hashem your God gives you and shall put it in a basket and go to the place that Hashem your God will choose to make his name rest there. A lot of giving. <laughs> God is giving us the land. God is giving us the fruit. God is giving us our, our lives. And, he's, and, he, and Moses is saying, when you get the land that God promises you, when you have the fruit that comes out of the ground that God gives you, a lot of giving, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of I think maybe 10 times it says in the first paragraph that God's giving. So as we know, we, we, understand, we understand God as the, 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 the source of everything, that God is a, is a giver. <clears throat> and it comes from a place of expansiveness. It, comes, it doesn't come from a need. God has no need. He has no need to give. We have a need to receive. We have a need to give because we're human. But we are, we, are, we are receiving this good that God is giving us. And, and this mitzvah that Moses is teaching the Jewish people, it's the mitzvah of Bikurim. It's the mitzvah of the first fruits. When you, the Jewish people, go into the land and you plant, and, and it's the land that God promised you, and you've taken over the land, and you've planted in the land, and it's going to bring forth fruit. So we're talking here about the seven species that are indigenous to the land of Israel, the, and specifically the pomegranate, the fig, the grapes, these, these produce that come from the land of Israel, um, these seven species, that when these seven species start to grow, you're going to take the first of the crop and you're going to bring it to Jerusalem. It doesn't actually spell out the place, the place that I will show you. It says the place that I will choose, that's Jerusalem, to so the Holy Temple, and that's built in Jerusalem. The, the farmer has to take his, he has to walk around his crops and he has to see when the fig starts to grow and he's going to label that first fig. He's going to label that first grape and, he's, and when it's ready, he's going to take it to Jerusalem. And it's a big celebration. It's a huge gathering of all the farmers. It was, apparently was the most joyous of all events. I and mean, it's, it's described in great detail how the Jewish people, the farmers are coming to Jerusalem and they're coming with their produce and they're coming with full hearts and with the abundance and with the sense of miracle and the sense, the sense that God is gifting them everything. And from here, we learn so much about the Mida, the character trait of gratitude. Um, I know that we've been growing some tomatoes in my yard, so we're not very good at growing, but we really like took care of this little tomato plant and we're pouring water on it every day and we're watching it and we're watching it. And all of a sudden <laughs> there were like little flowers on it and then there were like little cherry tomatoes started growing. And I have to tell you, it was so amazing. I was so excited about these little cherry tomatoes. So obviously in Rhode Island, and uh, you know, it's not one of the seven species, but can you imagine being a farmer who's, come, who's growing his crops in the land of Israel and he, and, he's, and, he's, and he gets the water from the heavens. It's not like the river Nile that overflowed. Um, it's really the water from heaven. It's the rainfall that the farmer is dependent upon and, that, uh, and, that he, and, that, and the, the miracle of the growth of these produce. And the farmer is told, you're gonna to take, you're gonna make sure, look, look for the figs, look for the, grapes look for those first fruits 
tie a little string around them. When they're ready, you're going you're gonna to take them to the temple. You're going to bring them up with great celebration. You're going to take them to the Kohen. You're going to give them to the Kohen in the, in the temple. It's apparently just joyous and music and, and, and celebration. And then you're going to say a whole narrative. You're going to say, an Aramean tried to destroy my forefather. He descended to Egypt and sojourned there, few in number, and there he became a nation, great, strong, and numerous. The Egyptians mistreated us and afflicted us and placed hard work upon us. He's giving a whole narrative of what happened in Egypt and how the Aramean here is Lavan and how Lavan and our forefathers had a whole altercation and da 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 da. It goes way back. We're going to hear the whole the whole history of how it was that this farmer today 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 today. How did we get to where we are today? We were carried on the shoulders of our ancestors, of our lineage, of our Jewish people throughout history, going all the way back to our forefathers. And here we are today. So yes, you can be grateful for the cherry tomato. The that's growing in my yard in Providence, Rhode Island. I can be grateful for the cup of coffee I drink in the morning. I love my cup of coffee in the morning. But but do I, I don't take the time. Take the time to write the narrative. Where did the coffee bean come from? It came from this farmer out in who knows where, like Colombia, and then he picked it and he shipped it and he can, and, 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 and all these steps till I get my cup of coffee. If I really think like that, I'm blown away by my cup of coffee. Um, and that's what, the Torah is teaching us. That's what Moses is teaching us. Like when you bring this first fruit, you, the farmer, have come into the land. You've started to grow your produce and this produce has sprouted and, and brought forth. Why? Because it's a gift. It's a miracle. <laughs> so take that miracle and be cognizant of where it came from. It came from this long story going back to Lavan, going back to Egypt, coming, being brought out by Moses. And Hashem took us out of Egypt with a strong hand. And the farmer, when he comes to the Kohen, to the priest in the temple, has to say this whole long narrative as he's bringing his Bikurim, his first fruits, to the temple. And God took us out, and it was awesome with signs and wonders, and he brought us to this place and to this land flowing with milk and honey. This whole narrative he has to say, and they take the fruit and they, and they wave it, and they bow down to God. And it's not just a bowing, it's a prostrate, the whole body. Like, I... The farmer, I, the Jew in, in, in 2020, recognize that everything I have comes from God. Everything I have, my whole life. Um, we have a, a modim prayer that we say in our silent prayer every day. And it's, and it's done as we bow and we say, you know, God, everything comes from you. If I can really internalize that teaching, my life, my health, my wealth, my relationship, you know, my, you know the people in my life, the gifts, this all a gift. And what Moses wants the people to know is that it's a gift. And the Bikurim is interesting because the, 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 the first fruit that's, de, 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 that's described in the Torah today, in this week's Torah portion, is the fig. So I want to take us back to the Garden of Eden. I want to take us back to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Remember, there's a tree of knowledge of good and evil. And apparently some of the commentators suggest that that was the fig tree. It was a fig tree. So now we're bringing the fig. We have to bring our first figs. We're, we're again connecting the whole story, the whole, we exist within time. God exists outside of time. So when, when the farmer is bringing his figs, there's a, there's a remedy, there's a tikkun, there's a rectification for what Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden when they ate from that tree of knowledge of good and evil and they shouldn't have, and they ate the fig. So now the farmer's bringing the fig and he's declaring, my first fruits come from you, everything comes from you. And he says this whole history because he's linking himself back to all the kindnesses that God has done over the course of the history of the Jewish people. We're linking ourselves to the history of the Jewish people. And maybe even in our modern history, we could we, we say today, we hear people who are literally descendants of Holocaust survivors. And they say, you know, like, I, I'm a miracle. I'm a miracle because my grandfather, my parents survived the Holocaust. How is it possible they survived the Holocaust? How is it possible that this and that and all the miracles that got that happened such that this person survived so that I could be born? So I'm here today. I'm a miracle. And, and when we see ourselves as miracles, when we see ourselves as um, gifts, gifts, we each one of us are a gift. And what we do and how we act in the world, if we're cognizant of that, we're going to operate from a place of gratitude. And that's what the Bikurim are teaching us. It actually says in our tradition that the world was created in order for there to be Bikurim. Meaning, meaning that the foundation of creation, the foundation of humanity, and the, certainly create the foundation of the Jewish people is 
the attributes of gratitude. Um, we're called Yehudim. We're called Jews, Yehudim, from the root Yehuda to, to thank, from, from, from the root of thanking. And uh, we're people who thank. We're people who are aware of the gift of our lives, of our people's existence, of everything that we have. And if we can really get in touch with that, um, that's, what, that's what we're being taught to do. And that's, that's existentially important. That's the foundation of our lives is gratitude. So the Hebrew um, expression for gratitude is hakaris tov. It means that we're recognizing the good. It means that if we can really do this, you know, the gratitude journals, they sound, they sound hokey, but they're not. They're so fundamental to our muscle of gratitude. If we write down a few things that we're grateful for every day, grateful for this, grateful for that, grateful for my coffee, grateful for my health, grateful that my eyes work, that my legs work, that I can breathe, that the, that the, that the, that the sun comes up every day and it's warm, you know, big things, little things, um, all it's all a gift and I think that if we if we really want to enter into the Rosh Hashanah period um, Rosh Hashanah is the rush it's the beginning and what we're doing what we're learning about is the beginning the Bikurim the fruits are the first fruits at the beginning we don't even know what the crops gonna look like this farmer when he's bringing his fig this is a, a crucial point when he's bringing his figs and his grapes and his and his wheat and his his seven species up to the temple and he's bringing it to the Kohen and he's talking his whole narrative the whole history of the Jewish people recognizing the good he has no idea what's going to come. He doesn't know he's going to come back and have a bumper crop or a small crop or a, but he's coming from a place of, I'm so happy I got this fig. <laughs> I'm so happy. I mean, I can relate to it on a very tiny scale. I'm so happy I have a few cherry tomatoes growing on my tomato tree outside, but it's sort of a, um, a, a launching pad to kind of understand how, how it must be for the farmers to see these figs start to grow in his fig tree and the grapes, etc., etc., etc. So, this attitude, this gra this attitude of gratitude, and recognizing the good, and linking it all back to God, and saying, "Yes, I put my efforts in, and yes, I plow the field, but it's only it's only because God brings the rains, and it's only because God has 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 set things up that this plant is growing, and that I'm getting the crop that I'm getting, and that a reliance of God on God, and that ability for us to recognize that is fundamental." to our functioning well in the world. And it's, we, we learn about this Bikurim, the first fruits, we learn about this Rosh Hashanah. So Rosh Hashanah is, as we know, the head of the month, is the head of the year, it's the beginning. It's the beginning of the year. So the mystical teachings teach us that everything goes after the beginning, that the beginning is crucial as a foundation for the rest of the year to come. The beginnings, when you go, if, you, if, you, if, if I was to get a scratch, in my adult self, so I get a scratch, it hurts a little bit. If I get a scratch as a child, I'm gonna cry a lot. If I get a scratch as an embryo, it's gonna really affect me. If I get a scratch as a, like the further back you go to the beginning and the, the tiny, um, the tiny, scratches, so to speak, that could happen in utero, gonna have a huge effect how that's going to be revealed, how that's going to manifest itself later down the line. And that idea of the beginning of something being the foundation for how it's going to manifest later is how we could um, think about our Rosh Hashanah season. Rosh Hashanah is, a, is, a, is an amazing opportunity for us to start again. Written into the fabric of the universe, we've said this before, is the capacity to start again. We are who we are. And we can start again and we can renew everything. So when we learn about Bikurim and we learn about Rosh Hashanah, what we're enjoying to think about is how to go back to the beginning. One of the things I'm going to jump ahead a little bit in the Torah portion that it says that after the, the mitzvah of the Bikurim and after the, the uh, Moses telling the people they have to tithe and they have to separate, they have to give to, they have to give Sadaka, they have to give um, some of their produce to the priest, they have to give it to the Levite, they have to give it to the poor and the stranger, the orphan, the widow. We have to share our abundance. I'm going to come back to that. Um, Moses commanded the people on that day saying, these shall stand to bless the people. Oh, sorry, that's not what I wanted to know. Um, here, Moses and the elders of Jerusalem commanded the people saying, observe the entire commandment that I command you today. It's one commandment. What's that one commandment? And many of the uh, commentators say that that commandment is teshuva, is 
the commandment is the opportunity that we have, especially at this time of this month of Elul coming into Rosh Hashanah, to begin again, to go back to our, our foundational selves, to go back into who we are, dig deep down, to like almost like pull apart our hearts and go down into our souls and say, who am I and what do I want? And if I know what I want, then if I really know what I want, if I can like peel back the layers, right? All right, so I want, I want, what do I want? Why do I want that? Why do I want that? Like keep, keep asking the why questions if you ask yourself, what is it that I want? And you'll get back to the uh, essence of why you want what you want. And that says our, com our uh, mystics is who you are. You are who you, what you want. And if we can get in touch with what we want and then go from there, that's part of the work of Rosh Hashanah. The part of the work of Rosh Hashanah is to understand what it is that we want and, and to go existentially. Like, I don't want materialism. I want relationship. I want relationship to God. I want relationship to other people. I want relationship to myself on a deep soul level. And, and those things are the foundation for the for the work that I'm going to do through the year because if I can get in touch with that at the beginning then that's going to be that's going to be who I am when I when I'm when I'm in prayer on Rosh Hashanah and we we understand this idea that God's going to give us what we need to be who we can be on Rosh Hashanah right judge is going to judge us and give us what we need to actualize ourselves in the coming year. I think it's a positive spin. Obviously, there's lots of other spins on what's happening in Rosh Hashanah, but one of the th ways to think about Rosh Hashanah is, I'm coming with a, with a desire, I'm coming with a yearning, and if I am in touch with what it is that I want, that I really, really, really want, deep down, existentially want, what I want for my, for my, for my potential to be actualized in the world, these might be very esoteric thoughts, but to even write to understand why it is what we want, what we want, and then God will help us go there. So let's let's think about that. Let's use the month of Elul to like think about what we want to be in the coming year and really, 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 really kind of dig deep and, and, and uncover our, our insides, our soul, and let that speak. So the idea of abundance, the idea of the first fruits, the idea that God is in control of our produce and our lives and that there's a relationship that we, the Jewish people, have that's like a firstborn nation. Right? We talk about the first. There's a lot of firsts, right? We have Rosh Hashanah as a first. We have the first fruits. We have the Jewish people considered to be the quote-unquote firstborn, meaning that we have a special role to play in the world. Everybody has a role to play in the world. The Jewish people have a, a, um, a firstborn quote-unquote role to play, meaning that we that we we're, we're like the conduits for the Torah, bringing that light into the world. That's our job. Um, and so when we connect to God on Rosh Hashanah, when we connect to God through the month of Elul, we understand that there's a greater potential. There's a, like a speed dial to God during Elul. So we're going to try to use this time to really connect. And one of the ways that we really connect is through gratitude. That's what we're learning in this week's Torah portion. Bikurim is teaching us the character trait of gratitude when we when we're really grateful who is happy he who is grateful with his lot he who is uh who is, what does it say in the pick of us who is who is who is happy who he who is satisfied with this lot he who has everything right do i have everything <laughs> do i have everything do i have what i need do i have what i need and if i really feel like i have what i need um yes i want things yes i'm yearning for things but I, um, on some in the moment moment in the present i have what i need and if i get in touch with that if i recognize that i have everything that i need then i can feel abundant i can feel full and from that feeling of fullness from that recognition that i have what i need then there's an overflow then there's an abundance right i'm not operating from a place of need i need this i need that i'm taking i've got to get i've got to get i've got to get i'm getting i'm coming from a place of expansiveness i've got what i need my cup's full and now it's overflowing now i'm operating if i can get to this place now i'm operating i'm operating from a place of um image of godness god doesn't need anything god is overflowing he's the quintessential existential everything everything giver i want to be like god i want to fill myself up i want to be feel like i have everything i need then i have to really work on gratitude if i work on gratitude and i really feel 
that I recognize that I have everything, then I will be basimcha. I will be so happy. I'll be so happy. And from this place of happiness and abundance, and I have I have it all, then comes expansiveness and sharing. And what the farmer is asked to do is take his bikurim, take his offerings and share them. Share them with the priest, share them with the Levite, share them with the poor. And it's not like, oh, I'm being so kind and I'm giving you my things. It's like, I have so much and I don't, you know, I want to share it with you. What do they say about Sadaka? I wish if I can find that quote. There's an amazing quote about Sadaka. I can't find it. Sorry. Oh, well. That, that, that essentially it's that, that the, that the uh, opportunity and the, the opportunity I have to give what I, I get back what I give away, right? Like, <laughs> like I, I am full in my act of giving. And, um, and so it, it, it's a win-win situation. If I'm holding on and I'm, and I'm operating from a place of scarcity, then I'm, I'm not operating at my full self. If I'm operating from a place that I have everything I need and it's overflow and it's abundance and I'm sharing and I'm, and I'm, and I'm enthusiastic about that, I'm excited about that. Why? Because it's connecting me to my full self and my full self is connected to God. So all, all around I'm connecting to a much bigger picture than me, this little individual person, wherever I am. I'm connecting myself to the bigger reality. I'm connecting myself to the expansion of the universe. I'm connecting myself to God, who is who is the source of everything. And if I do that, then I'll be full of joy. So the gift, now, the gift here is not only a physical first fruit. The gift is connection to God, right? God giving me the fruit, <clears throat> and I'm taking the fruit and I'm bringing it to the priest in the temple, I'm connecting it, this fruit, this physicality, I'm connecting it to something bigger and holy and great and I'm connecting it to God and I'm thanking God and I'm grateful for the opportunity to connect to God. And it's a mitzvah. God says, bring your first fruits. The farmer's bringing his first fruits. And what's the first thing he does when he brings his first fruits? The first thing he does is he offers a prayer. Let's see if I can find it. You'll be glad with everything you have. And when you finish doing all this, um, here's, what, here's what the farmer says. When, he, when he's, given, he's given his bikurim, he's given his offerings, he's given his tithes, he's done everything that, he, that God has asked him to do. <sighs> then the, the, the farmer asks God, gaze down from your holy abode from the heavens and bless your people Israel and the ground that you gave us and you swore to our forefathers a land flowing with milk and honey gaze down and bless us what's the farmer doing he's taking his abundance he's doing what God tells him to do he's bringing it with joy and simcha and celebration and and expansiveness and all of that and he's bringing it bringing it and doing what he's done and then he prays then he says, thank you. Please bless everybody. He's asking for something. He's asking God to bless the land, to bless the people. He's praying. And from this we learn, amazing, amazing. From this we learn that anytime we do a mitzvah, we can add a prayer because the mitzvah is opening up a channel. The mitzvah is opening up a connection to God. When I light candles on Friday night, I'm doing what God wants me to do. I'm lighting candles. Hashem has commanded me to light the candles. I'm lighting the candles. I'm doing a mitzvah. I'm lighting the candles. And on the tail of that mitzvah that's opened up the heavens, I'm offering a prayer. I pray for my children. I pray for the world. I pray for health. I pray for this person. I pray for that person. It's not, there's a mechanism here. It's not just, oh, isn't it nice to pray over the Shabbos candles? It's this teaching. It's I'm doing a mitzvah. I'm opening up the channels. And while the channels are op open, I now have the auspicious time to plug in and, and piggyback some prayers onto that. <laughs> Not that we don't have, we can't pray all the time. Of course we can pray all the time, but we, but it's an auspicious time when the farmer's bringing his crops his first fruits his, from the seven species and he's bringing it to the temple and he's doing a mitzvah. What's he doing? He's then praying. He's, he's, it's auspicious moments. Our auspicious moments today are when we do mitzvahs. When you give tzedakah, like people give tzedakah in the shul on the weekdays, you give tzedakah. Or like when you pledge on your yiska appeal, Yom Kippur is coming up, we're going to pledge on our yiska appeals. We're giving tzedakah. We're redistributing the wealth. We're taking what God gave us 
and and wants us to redistribute it because it's not really ours it's ours to give away thank you for giving it to me so i can give it away it's not mine 10 percent. i'm giving it away i'm doing a mitzvah and on that on that mitzvah of sadaka i'm praying please save this person help this person like bring a prayer along with it and and we learn that like with Sadaka where we do that with Sadaka we do it with lighting Shabbos candles and the Bikurim we're doing it and you can think of many opportunities where we're doing that where we're doing a mitzvah and at the same time as we're doing a mitzvah we're offering we're offering our prayers maybe you see people at um at orthodox weddings and maybe not just orthodox weddings at jewish weddings right we're, we're doing all these mitzvot under the chuppah there's the baracha and this and that and the other and people are praying you see you look around the room and people are praying why is this an auspicious time because there's so many mitzvahs going on here that, that, that you know we're, we're opening up the channels we're opening up the channels let's ride that wave and, and and bring our prayers up and that's what we can do and that's what we're learning from the bikurim from this farm it's fantastic and we do it today we do it today every time you do a mitzvah add a prayer I had a prayer. I'm praying for this. I'm praying for this. Return a lost object. Visit the sick person. Offer a prayer. And, and it doesn't have to be only for the sick person that you're visiting. You can offer other prayers for other people and other things. Or just thank you. Thank you, God. Like, recognize our humility. Recognize our smallness. And at the same time, recognize our greatness. You know, at the same time as we're recognizing the smallness and we're humble and we're, and we're, and we're nothing in one pocket. On the other hand, we're like everything. The whole world was created for us. And we have so much power to do so much. So let's do that. So go back to Adam and Eve in the garden of uh, in, the, in the garden of Eden, and it says over and over and over again in Genesis, and and it was they were blessed with all the, the there was everything that they needed in the garden, and they had it all, and it was all 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 it was coal. They had everything they needed, and they still ate from the tree of knowledge and good and evil. They ate the fig. Let's say some of the commentators say it was a fig. And then God says, "Where are you?" And 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 Adam blames Eve. <laughs> You're like the woman you gave me. Right, so they're expelled from the Garden of Eden. And our job is to bring us back, right? Each one of us has a role to play to bring back humanity into that place. That's why we're here. <laughs> so one, one mitzvah at a time, one good deed at a time, one prayer at a time, one act of recognizing God's gifts to us at a time. And again, back to that teaching that said, the whole world was created in the merit of Bikurim, in the merit of us expressing the good, recognizing the good that God gave us. That's, that's the foundation of our lives and it's the foundation of the year and it's the foundation of the Jewish people living in the land that God gave us. So it all comes around. So we are grateful, we understand this gift from God, we understand that we are loved by God, that God is giving it to us for no particular reason other than he loves us. And that's a humbling, if anything, if anything, that's completely humbling, that it's an unconditional giving from God to us. That we recognize the good, not just in the cup of coffee that I drink, but because of the whole history of how I got that cup of coffee. And not just the first route, but the whole history of the Jewish people going back to the forefathers coming through the Israel, the Egypt experience. That all of that, I'm grateful for all of that. Is it possible to be grateful for all of that? Maybe not. And But even to tap into that, says our Torah will bring you to a place of simcha, will bring you to a place of joy. And in that place of joy, and in that place of simcha, and in that place of recognizing the good, and that you have everything you need, and in that place comes abundance, your feeling of abundance, and then I can give it. So there's a story about Reb Zusha, the famous Reb Zusha. And there's a person struggling with, uh, with what's going on in the world, and how do I do this, and how do I feel simcha, and there's so much suffering in the world. So somebody says to him, go visit Reb Zusha and go ask him. So he goes to Rab Susha, and Rab Susha lives in a hovel, and he has boils all over his face, and and his and he's has sickness, and his children are suffering, and it's like terrible. It's like a picture of, like the the worst possible, you know, make it up, whatever it is. And this man comes to Rab Susha, and he says, I, I I'm I'm struggling with all the all the difficulties in the world, and 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 you're so happy. Because Rab Susha is like, oh, welcome, shalom aleichem, come in, you know, come into my hovel. I'm sitting at this table with three legs, you know, whatever. And he says, like, how are you so happy? How is it that you could be so happy? And he says, why not? I've never suffered. 
And the man's blown away. What do you mean you've never suffered? And from, from him looking in, it looks like all suffering. It looks like he had, like Rab Zusha has nothing. But from Rab Zusha's perspective, he has everything. He has everything he needs because he sees everything coming from God. So it's, it's a high level, but it's something to learn about, something to know about. Like, again, like somebody posted a, uh, um, a question on Facebook the other day about how, it, how to be a resilient person. What makes us resilient? How are we able to navigate through the hard times, the COVID times, the, the, the world we're in, how do we navigate through that? And I wonder whether on some level, one of the answers might be, how do we see it? How do we see it? Do we see it as, as abundant? Do we, do we look and see the goodness? Do we look and see the abundance? Do we look and see the love? Do we see the connections? What are we looking at? Half full, half empty. And, and this Torah portion is, is telling us focus on the good, recognize the good. And not that we should, it's not to deny there's difficulties and pain and suffering. Of course, of course. And there's also all the good. So, so in our moments where we're able to, let's recognize that we have good and there's a lot of good and focus on that and that will bring us to simcha and abundance joy so um another way to as i mentioned earlier this idea that we um that we connect to god that connection to god brings us happiness that that's also a way to be to be happy um there was one other one other thing so 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 um um this mitzvah when it when moses speaks to the jewish people and then he says <sighs> when he says, observe the entire commandment that I command you today, that's the mitzvah of teshuva, says many of our commentators. They are the mitzvah to go to go back to the beginning and start again and to recreate ourselves on Rosh Hashanah. And what a joy that that is, right? So I can be mired in all the things I've done wrong and I'm so sorry I did this and I did that. And that is the work of this season to, to, to look back and say, oh, you know, I need to prune that brush and I, you know, metaphorically, you know, <laughs> but where are my roots? You know, are my roots grounded in goodness? Am I a good person? Do, am I, do I want good things? Yes. Yes. And maybe, you know, some of my limbs have done things that are wrong, but I'm going to chop those off because I want to focus on my root. What do I want? I want goodness. I want love. I want connection. I think we all want that. And if we go back to that and focus on that and say, I have a relationship with God and God's in the field, so to speak. God's up close right now in the month of Elul. And, and even just to know that on some level and to yearn for that connection, that's the Rosh Hashanah. And that connection and knowing that we have that capacity, even if we just know it intellectually or think about it, that should bring us to a place of, a place of joy, I think. <laughs> so one of the things that we do on Rosh Hashanah, I think, many of us, is that we cry. We have the capacity to cry, and I and I, I think it's a really good thing. And when we read many places, the um, the the work of crying, the work of tears, and how the tears open up, the tears wash wash away a lot of the, a lot of the things that we're holding on to, and that tears. We've we've said before the tears are the sweat of the soul, but uh, I read something else which is really beautiful. That tears are the ink of my soul. What am I painting with those tears? When my tears are shed, like well, how do I use those tears? Am I using those tears to cry out to God? Am I using those tears to wash away, you know, to wash away, to clean myself, to like pare myself away, like to get down deep and to uh, recognize that I have this connect this potential for connection to God and that's what I want all right so God's going to gaze down God's going to gaze down and he's and we're asking him to bless us we're, we're asking us to bless us um so that's what we're going to do on the heels of it okay so so now let's keep going um let's keep going so right so after the Bikurim this Cohen is coming. We're bringing it to the Cohen. We're full of gratitude. We're full of love. We're full of joy. We're full of connection. We're bringing everybody in. We're sharing everything with everybody. <laughs> and then we go back. And then Moses is continuing to tell the Jewish people, you can do teshuva. It's not far. It's right there. It's not far from you. It's right in front of you. It's not, it's not a mitzvah that's far away. Um, but then when you go into the land, here's what you have to do when you go into the land. I'm going to read this to you. Um, when you cross the Jordan to the land that Hashem your God gives you, you shall set up great stones and you shall coat them with plaster and you shall inscribe on them all the words of this Torah when you cross over so you may enter the land that Hashem your God gives you, a land flowing with milk and honey. 
So we're going to go into the land. We're going to build a monument of stones. We're going to put plaster on it. And we're going to write Torah on it. We're going to write words of Torah on it. We're going to offer uh, a sacrifice. We're going to build an altar. We're going to offer sacrifice. But we're going to write the Torah on stones. So it's a fantastic image of stones. So what do we write Torah on? In our synagogues, we have Torah on parchment. We have it on animal skin, right? Something that's living. The first, the first words of the Torah that were written down here in, and when we're entering the land are written onto stone. We, we talk about um, engraving our heart with the words of Torah. So these, these ideas of engraving into our hearts and writing the Torah, writing, writing Torah onto stone is about something that's unchanging, something that's solid, something that's foundational. And that's what Moses is telling Jewish people. When you go into the land, write it down. Write it down on something that's not going to change. Write it down on something solid. Write it down on something that isn't going to get washed away or change, you know, over time. It's going to stay solid and stay rock. And that's your foundation. So we're going to go into the, to the land and we're going to get wealthy and we're going to have the challenge of being wealthy, but we're going to have this monument written with engraved on it. This, this, the words of Torah, they're going to be built and it's going to be solid. So I like that. I like this unchanging. It's fixed, not on parchment. And it's going to be written in 70 languages, which is miraculous. And, and we have it there for all time. It's going to be there and you're going to be able to see it and going to hold on to it. So there's um, a teaching that says that our hearts, metaphorical hearts, have two layers. We have an an inner layer that's, that's like rock, that's solid, that isn't going to change. And then we have an outer layer that changes and morphs and grows. And, and uh, so, so what, what we're trying to do, perhaps, perhaps what we're trying to do is take the Torah, take this wisdom and, and write it down on the inside. <laughs> write it down on that part of us that isn't changing, that's there, that's rock, that's solid, that's engraved. And it's going to stay with us. And even if we go off track and even if we, you know, we're going to go through our year and we're going to get distracted or not, we're going to be have something inside that we can return to. I don't know. I like these imageries. I like the idea that that what we have deep down inside of us is unchanging and is real and is connected to God and 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 is something that we can fall back to, you know, when everything else is um, peeled away. I heard an amazing story. Was a, there's a, a teacher in town, Rachel Zarin, and she told him a, um, a story. I think it's in, uh, I think it's a Medrash. I'm not sure. Maybe it's a, in the Gemara. I think it's a Gemara that speaks about two rabbis who are on two different boats traveling to a foreign land. So there's a rabbi in one boat and Rabbi Akiva, I believe, on the other boat. So the one rabbi, I can't remember who it was, is watching the boat of Rabbi Akiva and it gets caught, they get caught up in a big storm and Rabbi Akiva's boat, Rabbi Akiva's boat is being torn apart and it's broken up and Rabbi Akiva is presumed by Rabbi A to be, have died and drowned in this flood, in this, sorry, in this storm. So he's mourning the loss of his friend. He gets to the shore and he comes on land and he sees Rabbi Akiva learning Torah with a bunch of people sitting on the shore learning Torah. And he's like so grateful. Brach Hashem, thank God you're still alive. How is it possible that you're still alive and you survived that shipwreck? And Rabbi Akiva says, when the storm was in its most fierce and, and intense, the boat was broken up and I held on to one piece of wood. I held on to a piece of wood and that wood I held on to and I, and I held on to it with all my might and the waves were smashing and blowing and everything was going crazy and I held on and then the storm abated and I, and I came to shore and here I am. And the moshal, the parable is, what is it that we're holding on to? What's that proverbial piece of wood that we're holding on to what's the what's the constant that we have and again at this season of teshuva it's not far from us it's right here uh, the bikurim the gratitude the, the the idea of the of the monument and writing torah on stone what's deep down what do we have to hold on to we have the torah to hold on to and god to hold on to so when the waves are crashing and when everything's a storm and it looks like there's no hope Hold on, hold on. We're Jewish people of gratitude and of and of and of relationship to God, but we're also a, a Jewish people of hope and recognition that God's with us and God's going to hold us and God's here. So yes, we're going to read in this week's Torah portion about these curses that are going to come if we don't follow God and all the blessings that if we do follow God. And it's on and on and on. The curses are on and on and on. It's really a long 
Torah reading with lots of things that can happen if we turn our backs on God. But I think one of the things to recognize in all of this, and it's a really lovely teaching actually, is what it says about the curses. One of the things it says is the Egyptians gave us back breaking labor and that word gave us. Just as God is giving us blessing and he's giving us fruit and he's giving us abundance and he's giving us health and he's giving us wealth, he also gave us the back-breaking labor through the Egyptians. He also gave us our struggles. So yes, we like to be grateful to God in our abundance for sure. And that we should be doing for sure. Not say by my might, you know, not by bread alone do I live, but by the word of God. You know, like it's not me that's bringing all this abundance into the world for sure, for sure, for sure. But at the, on the other extreme to be consistent, um, and it's very hard because we live in a world of hiddenness, that as we're speaking the ideas out without the actual in reality, and it's, you know, I, I, that the idea is that we live in a world where we don't see God, um, we don't see the good in our struggles, we don't see the good in the pain and the, and the deaths and the disease and all of that's going on in the world. We don't see the good in that. We, we just don't. We live in a world where it's hidden. But on some level, the Torah, God is teaching us, I'm involved in it all. Right. And, and, and I, I don't profess to say have any answers as to why there's evil in the world or what, what you know, how could God bring suffering upon people? I, I don't have answers to that. I'm just sharing the teaching that says that it's all from God. Right. So the, the, the good things and what we perceive to be the bad things. And at the end of days, when it's all clear, which is not the world we live in now, it's tovumative. It's God who does good. It's all good. So that's where our imuna comes in. That's where our faith comes in. That even though there's a storm raging, and I I don't know up from down, and I'm and I'm seeing a lot of carnage all around. I'm holding on. What do I hold on to? What's that piece of wood? That proverbial piece of wood that I'm holding on to? And the Torah teaches us the piece of wood you're holding on to is that God's here. It's not random. It's not fate. It just doesn't happen by accident. <laughs> that there's meaning and purpose. And I don't know the meaning and purpose, but there is. And I can cry to God. I can cry to God. I can, I can sing to God. I can cry to God. I can, I, can, I can be angry with God. I can be a lot of things, but God's here. And at the moment where God's not here is, is the moment where we've lost our piece of wood. <laughs> so, you know, coming from that place of Amuna, coming from that place like of understanding that, that, that Moses wants the people to know God's with you. Even when all this stuff looks like it's bleak, God gave you it all, it all, all of it. He gave you the Garden of Eden and he gave you the exile. And at the end of days, we're going to get the Garden of Eden back, but we're, we're working our way through that. It's, it's the narrow bridge, right? Gesha, that this, this, there's a song about Rabbi Nachman um, coined this, this song, not the, not the song, but the, uh, the, uh, the phrase that this song is based on, where there's this narrow bridge, the world is a narrow bridge, and I shall not be, and you shall not be afraid, but in fact, the correct translation of you not shall not be afraid is, I shall not make yourself afraid. That we have the capacity to make ourselves afraid. That, that again, that's a choice. <laughs> like, there's only so much I can control. What can I control? That I'm going to work for. Anything that's out of my control, let go, right? So, again, it's an it's work. It's not easy to do and, and say, I don't have control over COVID. I don't have control over a lot of what goes on in the world. But the things I do have control over, I have control over. And the things I don't have control over, let go and let God in. You know, that's where God's going to run the world. And, and, and I trust that God's running the world for, for, for our ultimate benefit, because God is the ultimate giver. <laughs> so that's sort of like the bigger picture. But here we are, Rosh Hashanah. What's the work of Rosh Hashanah? What's the work of Kisavo? The work of Kisavo is gratitude and, uh, and, and looking with abundant eyes and seeing what we have, not what we don't have, and being able to be joyous with that and saying, I have what I need, what I need to be the best I can be and to bring my light into the world and to reveal godliness into the world. I have what I need for my piece of that puzzle, right? We all have it. We all need each other to be, be, to be the best each one of us can be to bring that light into the world. And I don't know why somebody has their struggles and I have my struggles. I don't know why, but we do. But God's here and it's all good. <laughs> so one of the things I wanted to point out, which is really lovely, 
is this idea that, where did I see it? That, um, that the, the love that we have for God um, is, when well, we say it in the Shema, right? We say that we should love God with our heart, with our soul, and with all of our resources, with ma'od. So I should love God with my heart, with my lev, the last letter, v. And I should love God with my nefesh, with my soul, sh. And I should love God with my resources, with everything I have, ma'od. And those, those spelled dvash, dvash, honey, sweetness. That, that through this relationship, there's sweetness. Through the relationship, there's sweetness. It transcends. It's be, it, it, uh, mundane. It's in the mundane. <laughs> you know, it's tied up with the mundane. And, it's, uh, and it takes us above. So it's all interconnected. So I really like that idea of heart, soul, and resources spelling sweetness. When we can get to the place where we bring it all, all of us, to that relationship, to the love relationship with God and with ourselves and with each other, we'll reach sweetness. That's the Dvash. Really nice, right? All right. So, um, so we're going to have all these, 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 these blessings if we if we turn towards God if we yearn for that we're going to have things that aren't going to go away that are terrible and we're going to you know it's read in an undertone um in the in the Torah if, if you hear the Torah being read all of the things that that are that are negative all the quote-unquote curses the tochacha that are going to happen if we don't follow God and we don't and we turn our back on God all of that's read really quietly because it's really a lot and then at the end Moses says to the people, you have seen everything that Hashem did before your eyes in the land of Egypt. You saw that to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land, the great trials that your eyes beheld, those great signs and wonders. But God did not give you a heart to know or eyes to see or ears to hear until this day, right? You had to go through all that. You had to see it all. You had to experience it all. You had to go through the desert for 40 years. I led you for 40 years, says Moses. I led you for 40 years in the wilderness. Your garment did not wear out from on you. Your shoe did not wear out from under your foot. Bread you did not eat and wine or intoxicant you did not drink so that you would know all of that. So you would know that I am Hashem, your God. And you arrived at this place and Sihon, king of Hezbon and Og, king of Basham, went out towards us in battle and we smote them. We took their land and gave it as an inheritance to the Reubenites, the Gadites and half the tribe of the Manassites. You shall observe the words of this covenant so you will succeed in all that you do. So at the end of the day, Moses is saying, <laughs> you're going to renew this covenant. You're going, you the Jewish people are in a relationship with God. It's a relationship of love. It's a relationship of I'm Segula. We're a special treasured nation. We have work to do to bring that, to partner with God, to bring that into the world. And, and we have to want it. We have to want it. We have to recognize God's here with us every step of the way. And it's hard. It's really, really hard when, when life seems to be so adrift and so, and so beyond us. Um, it's hard to, 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 oh, here's the thing I wrote, I wrote about charity, but it's hard. It's hard. And it's not hard because God's going to help us. If we want it, God will help us. And it's opening ourselves up, getting to that core of who we are, writing the Torah on that core, letting it sink in. And maybe it takes a lifetime and maybe we won't achieve it in our lifetime, but we have to want to want it. So I think at the end of the day, it's really about what do we want? And if I want to see the world with abundance, if I want to be grateful, if I want to live with Simcha, then I have to do that. I have to, I have to recognize the good and I, and I have to start with wanting and then we'll go from there. So on, um, on Rosh Hashanah, one of the things that it says is going to change, you know, change us is giving Sadaka. So here's the phrase that I wanted to quote. Sadaka is the safest, most effective preservative of all ensuring that our money will stay with us, not to our detriment, to our benefit. So if we use our money well, if we use our resources well, then we'll benefit from them. If we hoard them and hold them and are scared, then we're not going to, then they, they're meaningless, right? So everything we have um, has a purpose and part of the purpose is to share them and to use them to make the world better, to make ourselves better, to make each other better, to, make the, to, to raise everything up. That's why we have what we have. So it's, it's, it's looking for a world of abundance. It's looking for even if we feel like we're in a world of scarcity, how do I see the world of abundance? So here's one more thing I want to quote before I end. And it's 
quality of giving. So this is a, a great book, Rabbi Desla. It's the Strive for Truth. So what does Rabbi Desla say about the joy of doing a mitzvah, the joy of connecting to God, the joy of opening up the channels, the joy of being able to see ourselves full? The quality of giving is inherent only in the person who is happy with his lot, right? So who is happy? He who is who is happy with it. Who is uh, rich? He who is happy with his lot. Am I happy with what I have? He is happy because his life is filled with the joys of spiritual pursuits before whose riches all other interests pale. In his happiness, he resembles a river in flood whose life-giving waters overflow all its banks. I'll read that again. In his happiness, I'm happy with my lot. I have what I need. If, I'm, if I have what I need and I'm happy with that and I feel like I have an abundance, then I... He, the person, one, resembles a river in flood. It's overflowing, whose life-giving waters overflow all its banks. Firmly rooted in the spiritual life, his eyes ever turn towards the heights. Look up. He sees, it's like the fly in the bottle, right? Like the fly can't get out of the bottle because he keeps looking around. But look up, and then there's the way out, right? He sees in everything, great and small, the loving kindnesses of Hashem, which are unending. The loving kindnesses of Hashem, which are unending. Again, the foundation of the earth, of the world was Bikurim. The foundation of our existence is understanding. It's all a gift and it's all coming from God. The loving kindness of Hashem, which, is, which are unending. Consequently, his joy in these gifts knows no bounds and his life is unendingly happy. Wow. Out of his fullness of joy and happiness flow giving and love. Thus, the urge to do good to others is not produced by a lack or a deficiency. God doesn't lack or isn't deficient of anything. God's giving comes from a place of abundance and, and, and everythingness, right? So how do we get to a place where we feel we are similar in that way of abundant and full? By being happy with our lot, right? It's an outflow of the ecstatic devotion by which the happy man is attached to a stem. It is an outflow of the ecstatic devotion by which the happy man is attached to Hashem. Think of the happiest person you see. Like I think of these Bretzlav Hasidim. I think of people dancing. I think of Chabad. I think of people who are so happy in their relationship to God that that's where they're, they're getting their sustenance from that from something beyond the physical. They're getting sustenance from God, from God, the giving God, they're getting sustenance there. How do I do that? By being happy with my lot, by recognizing that everything I have comes from God. Like these are the mechanisms, these are the, this is the work of now as we move to Rosh Hashanah. So that when we get to Rosh Hashanah, we, 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 we are, we are um, maybe in a place where that's what I wanna be, like I understand, that my beginning is starting in Rosh Hashanah, right? Adam was created in Rosh Hashanah. Joseph, our forefathers, was released from prison on Rosh Hashanah, right? Start again. We're going to start again. We're going to start again on Rosh Hashanah. We have 10 days between Rosh Hashanah to get to Yom Kippur, where we're going to like, we're going to open ourselves up one day at a time. We're going to open ourselves up and move through these 10 days. And, and each day has a different attribute attached to it we can talk about that maybe i'll give a class on that right before rosh hashanah about the work of the 10 days because there are 10 emanations of god in the world 10 spherot of the kabbalistic teachings each day matches up with another one so rosh hashanah rosh hashanah is the day of the highest the highest connection the keter the the sphere the divine emanation that is pure that is love that is giving that is unconditional that's that's the highest level of Rosh Hashanah is the connection to that, that God is only giving, only loving, only wants to pour love onto us. And we can sit here and go, I'm so unworthy, I'm so nothing, I'm so worthless. No, that's not the work of Rosh Hashanah. The work of Rosh Hashanah is to say, I'm a piece of God, therefore I am royalty. I'm connected, I'm worthy. Like how do we get to a place where we really feel worthy of this relationship we have with God? And I think part of it is opening ourselves up and saying, and saying it's not, it's not, it's not whether I've, I've, I've been good, it's that I am good, right? That's the Jewish teaching. We are all existentially, fundamentally at our core, good. And get in touch with that and go from there wow, <laughs> what potential we have, you know, to, to like push away all that negativity and say, I'm, 
I am a breath of Hashem. Breath, God is blowing His soul into me. What do we do on Rosh Hashanah with that, with that breath? We take the breath and we blow it back out through the shofar. We blow it back out because we don't even have words to describe it. I mean, I'm using words, but it's meaningless. It's not meaningless, but you can't even grasp it. It's beyond a capacity to really understand. So on Rosh Hashanah, we, we, we almost like don't speak. We, we cry Again, emotion, ink, soul, whatever, tears of soul sweat, of ink coming out. And I'm writing it on this parchment, on this stone that's deep in my heart, right? I want to engrave it on my heart so it's there. So that's the foundation of my year. And I'm opening myself to this breath connection that God is breathing on. So he's making everything new all the time. It's new all the time. All the time, everything new. Like you go outside and there's new buds and there's tomatoes on my... There's another tomato that wasn't there yesterday. Hooray! How miraculous is that? There's creation, recreation all the time, the newness, and we are also able to recreate ourselves and do new things and be new people. And it's hard because we're like in our rut and people will think we're weird if we change. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Like, you know, on some level what other people think, that's their problem. But if I'm, if I'm really in touch with this, like I really feel like we can we can harness the energy of this of this time period of Elul and Rosh Hashanah and into the 10 days, like we're really able to recreate and be new and be passionate and yearn and grow and be new and like, like and, and do it, seize the moment, all of that, like bring that and that will bring us so much joy and so much happiness. And the, so we see that Chesed, that the kindness of the giver isn't coming from a place of lacking, it's coming from a place of abundance it's the overflow of his happiness it comes not from lack or deficiency but from fulfillment so that i guess that's what i end on so i wish us all a, an amazing week um it, we, we're in the middle of elul so i think nine nine or ten of elul um i'm going to post on my facebook page uh, a link to a 40-day workbook that my friends elisa bulo and lisa levine wrote that has um, day by day kind of things to think about, uh, you know, questions to answer, things to ponder, like to help us dig deep, to help us to go into ourselves. Because at the end of the day, right, we can only change ourselves. So let's work on doing that. Let's work on revealing who we are. Let's work on knowing who we are. Let's recognize that we are connected to God and that that connection should bring us great joy. And when we recognize all the good that we have, and it's all a gift, just like the farmer with his bikurim, and just like the farmer coming to the temple with joy and singing and music, and he's bringing his first little fruit, and he's rectifying the sin of Adam and Eve in the garden. He's also rectifying the sin of the spies. Because what did the spies come back with? The spies came back with figs and grapes and indigenous species of the land of Israel and came back and said oh well, there's, there's giants there we can't do it and because of that the Jewish people had to wander in the desert for 40 years because of the report of the spies the evil report and they, they brought back these produce so again we're we're doing something by recognizing the Bikurim the farmers bringing those produce those same produce that the spies brought so too the farmers bringing the same produce to say ah we got it wrong. We're going to rectify that. We're going to me we're going to mend that. We're we're on the we're on the shoulders of things that came before us. We have work to do because we're part of the big Jewish people. We're part of one big cosmic everythingness, <laughs> and we each have one little bit bit of things to do. And and the the the, the attribute of humility, excuse me, the attribute of gratitude, which is obviously linked to humility, also because it's not me that did it, right? So it's humility and gratitude and recognizing God's gifts. That's the foundation of the world. And that's the foundation of us as we move in through the season and renew ourselves and restart ourselves. So we should all be blessed with the capacity to dig deep, to connect to ourselves, to God and to each other.